what a miracle life is. How lucky we are to exist on this planet, if even for a short time. And I'll tell you what makes me feel better about wasting that time and probably dying alone. Regularly consuming gigantic quantities of... Chocolate, yes. Delicious, eh? But how does chocolate end up in your terribly clever brain as the taste of chocolate? Well, your tongue and your schnoz, of course. Your tongue is covered in several thousand taste buds made up of about 50 gustatory receptor cells each. It's fairly accepted there are five building blocks of taste. Sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. Umami is basically the taste of savory stuff. Green tea and shiitake mushrooms are good examples if you're curious. That thing about different tongue sections tasting different flavors isn't true by the way, but hey ho. Now for taste, you'll need your nose too. Your nose is full of cells called olfactory sensory neurons quite high up. Different smells play these cells like molecular keys on a piano. Anyway, the information about the taste and smell of the chocolate from your excellent beak and mouth waggler get transmitted electrically to your brain, specifically the gustatory and olfactory cortex. And that's a great olfactory cortex you have there, by the way. And that information ends up somehow turning into the perception of the taste of chocolate. Easy, right? Well, okay, but you don't see chemical information about chocolate scrolling across your eyes like the Terminator. You experience it as a sensation, and that is the rub. Because we don't know yet how matter, how chemistry, how sugar and cocoa end up going from electrical signals in your brain to the taste of chocolate. The experience of chocolate in your mind. This is called the hard problem of consciousness. And if you don't mind, I would like to convince you today that it is the greatest mystery in history. The sensations of experience are called qualia. Qualia are the feels of something, how an experience tastes or looks or sounds. Take a sunset, if you will. In reality, all we're really seeing is wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum, in this case around 600 nanometers if we're being fancy schmancy. But your eyes turn those wavelengths into information and your brain turns that information into yellow and orange, into experience. And the colors themselves, as you see them, are the qualia, the orangeness of orange. It's the same with the hotness of heat, the sweetness of chocolate, the nausea of a tummy ache, the elements of experience. Imagine Imagine you were talking to someone who can't see color. How would you describe the color orange to them? Now, you might say, eh, it's like red but with more yellow in it. But that's not gonna work, silly. They don't know what the experiences of red and yellow are. Have you ever chomped on some asparagus, then gone to pee a little while later and almost passed out from the disgusting smell? If you haven't, that's because you don't have the gene or genes to detect asparagus metabolites. And you are one lucky papa because the smell is fucking vile. As far as we know, only about half the world population are lucky enough to have the genetics to detect it. The funny thing is, if you don't have the genetics, you'll never know what it's like. You could train as a scientist and specialize in the asparagus piss effect and become the world's leading authority on it. Bit weird, but you do you. You could know everything academically there was to know about the asparagus piss effect. Everything except the disgusting smell itself. Everything except the qualia. And the qualia are everything. If you've never seen a certain color, if you've never tasted a particular flavor, hell, if you've never been in love, you can read 10,000 eloquent descriptions of whatever, but that will never be the qualia. Description and experience live in two separate universes. In reality, of course, there is no such thing as asparagus piss, or the color orange, or the sound of a kettle boiling, or the coldness of snow. And if somehow we could experience objective reality directly, whatever that fucking means, all you would find in the real world outside of our heads is chemical compounds and wavelengths of EM radiation and vibrations in the air and relatively less energetic atoms. There is no orange. It is just one of the many millions of veils our brains drape over reality to understand reality. And if the brain is an electrochemical computer, if it's just meat, how does it turn electricity into experience, into the sweetness of chocolate, into the orange of a sunset, or from asparagus into the fine bouquet of Satan's taint? The hard problem of consciousness. How does the brain create qualia? Now, there are the so-called easy problems of consciousness. Stuff like, how is it that you, that is your brain, can shift your focus of attention between stuff? Or, how do you categorize information? These are a bit like the problem of how we'll get humans to Mars or something. They're tricky problems, but they're technically feasible. With enough cocaine, coffee, scientists will probably crack them one day. The reason why the hard problem of consciousness is often considered the big boy of questions, the hard problem, is because as it stands today, we don't even have the beginning of the beginning of a sensible answer to it. How does this turn this 
into this? How does electricity get transformed into colors and sounds and experience? And as much as us clever 21st century carbon units know about the furniture of reality, about the curvature of space-time and the unpalatable presentation of a baboon's ass, nothing yet in our now vast libraries of the qualities of the natural world have much to say about how meat makes a mind. Despite the fact that we're made up of elements you'll find everywhere else in the universe, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen accounting for 99% of our bodies, something about the way those elements are put together turns into something that knows it's made of matter in the first place and has experiences. We're made of universe, but we actually know we're universe. We are food that can enjoy food. And yet, the hard problem remains. Now, what we're getting very good at doing recently is finding correlations between what your brain and body is doing, physical you, and what your mind is doing at the same time. The wibbly consciousness shit. We know that the hormone cortisol correlates very closely with anxiety. We know that an altered gamma brainwave pattern correlates very closely with epilepsy and several mood disorders. Or vice versa, we know if you're enjoying Downton Abbey erotic fanfiction, you'll probably be using your cerebrum for processing the text and so on we have a huge map of what brain area and biological process correlates with which mental state. But that doesn't tell us what the mechanisms of qualia and consciousness are yet, any more than if you asked how voting works in the UK and someone just showed you a picture of number 10 Downing Street. That's where. That's not how. Incidentally, that little feline outside is called Larry. He is the current chief mouser to the cabinet office. That's not me being quirky, it's true, and he's a very good boy, all right? The brain is a huge, unbelievably complicated network of inputs and outputs. It can do graphics and audio and parallel processing and storage. The thing is clearly a computer of sorts. But computation can't be the end of the story. Because computers are great at manipulating information like us, but as far as we know, computers don't experience information like us. Something is in this gap turning meat into experiences, if indeed we are just meat. There are a million theories as to what that process is, of course. Maybe consciousness is a fundamental property of matter distributed across the entire universe, and brains focus it somehow. Maybe it's just what happens when you integrate enough information in the right way. Or maybe it's a fancy illusion, and what it feels like to be you is just a side quest your brain is playing after it's already decided what it's going to do anyway. But one thing is for sure. Every proposal we have so far for qualia generation and consciousness requires the kind of explosive leap one only experiences the morning after eating California Reaper peppers. Elaborate as they are, every explanation so far is a physical description of matter. But what we want to know is how matter becomes experience. We must propel ourselves off the toilet of the brain-mind correlation towards the emodium of a final theory of consciousness. We must collapse the duality of the subjective and objective worlds once and for all. And talking of which, gosh, humans love dualities, don't we? Good versus evil, wads of paper versus lewashi bumble, Mind versus body. The mind-body problem is about as angry as you can make a philosopher. How can we explain what it's like to be a mind if minds are made out of university dead stuff? So, in a condescending pat-on-head fashion, the battle boils down to materialism versus non-materialism. Firstly, the argument from materialism, then. Materialism is basically the idea that everything in the universe, from galaxies to the weather to little owly wows, spring from physics, from matter, from quantum fields, not wibbly extra-physical stuff. The heart is a machine, there's no wizards in your spleen. As weird as it may be, why can't consciousness be a biological process like digestion or cell division? Humans have a bit of a tendency for claiming stuff we don't understand is supernatural. Well, it turns out the sun isn't pulled up by a chariot. Germ theory was a lot more of a powerful explanation for disease than getting cursed. Yes, consciousness is super weird. It's unlike any other phenomenon we've discovered so far, and we are in quite the pickle trying to explain it. But we've been in pickles before. The origin of species, the formation of galaxies. The answer is almost impossible to imagine until someone explains it scientifically. And then it's so obvious we can't believe we didn't get it earlier. Give science and philosophy some time with consciousness. We've done it before. We'll fucking do it again. Dare us, you cunt. Then there is the non-materialist response to that, and it sometimes goes a little like this. One, two, three, four. Yes, science has been super powerful in explaining the world around us, but hang on there, dick pump. Everything explained so far has been dead stuff. You can explain stars mechanistically because they are mechanistic. How, using our current picture of matter, are you going to jump from interactions and physical qualities to matter that knows it's matter, that feels like a mind, that has experiences? This isn't a gap because we don't have a materialist theory yet. It's a gap because materialism can't account for it. 
Even if you had a perfect map of correlations between what the brain is doing and how the person with the brain feels. Even if you had a special recipe that goes, Take some neural oscillations, add in X amount of integrated information, sprinkle in some quantum coherency, do a fucking backflip, and then brains will be conscious. Isn't that still just a description rather than an explanation again? Anyway, that's a pretty shit caricature of the materialist versus non-materialist debate as it stands today. If I've mischaracterized your position, please accept this vintage depiction of a Pomeranian. I hope we can still be friends. And on top of that, you might reasonably wonder why anyone should even give a shit about the hard problem of consciousness, or how consciousness arises anyway. We are conscious, we can see sunsets, shut up. But to that I would reply, no, y you. Yes, we might be far off cracking this thing, but if we crack it, if we finally set up a sturdy bridge between descriptions of physical states and mental states, if we have a working theory of the relationship between the brain and the conscious mind, it won't just herald in a shower of Nobel Prizes, it will mean we can start addressing actual endgame meaning of life questions. We will have codified answers to the existential quandaries dating back to the ancients. Like, do we actually have free will? And is consciousness baked into matter or is it an emergent phenomenon? And how do mothers turn food into thinking conscious people in their tummies? And could we one day make other stuff conscious, like machines or new artificially organized states of matter? And how did evolution create conscious animals anyway? Was it advantageous somehow? And okay, why was it? How was it better than just evolving biological robots? And for that matter, how conscious are our animal mates? And just what is a thought? How are we thinking or feeling for that matter? How the hell are we collecting, binding, and experiencing sensory information from the dead, mathematical world beyond our minds, and translating that into chocolate, and rakia, and cold, and rough, and misery, and curiosity, and indifference, and satisfaction, and ambivalence, and being. Just the feeling of being a being. What is qualia? How is experience even possible? Why the fuck is orange? I'm going out for the day, and don't smoke all my weed again. Yeah. There's a weird feeling you get sometimes if you're into all this consciousness stuff, because you can get knee-deep in the isms and the mudslinging and philosophers bullshitting each other, and you suddenly step back and think, oh my god, this isn't some highfalutin academic problem. The mystery is in me. The mystery is me. Right now, at the center of our heads is the point of contention of millennia of debate. Conscious experience. It is the greatest mystery. And if the greatest mystery of all time was hiding anywhere else but inside our own heads, we'd never stop fucking talking about it. But because it's so close, because it's us, it barely gets mentioned outside of academia. Every sense coming in, every color, every sound, every taste, the mystery is yelling at us the whole time. How is experience possible? How am I possible? What is inside me doing all of this? And maybe the same goes for mammals, for marine life, god knows who else. A bunch of non-human animals seem to have internal lives of some kind. Don't doggos go mental when we come home because they're actually feeling happy to see us? Didn't the killer whale J35 carry her dead daughter's body for a thousand miles, refusing to let her fall to the ocean floor? Not out of some robotic inbuilt reflex, but because she was sad. Because she was grieving. Beyond narrative, beyond nations, beyond history, possibly even beyond species in some cases, there is a common, insane experience of being a living thing in a cosmos of apparently dead things. Being a thing that doesn't just process information, but feels and hopes and regrets and hates and longs and dreads. The never-ending chatter of ourselves talking to ourselves. Who am I? I wonder how mum's doing. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. Should I be married by now? I think the milk is off. Do you still love me? I still love you. How will I die? When will I be happy? I should phone the post office. I should buy more toilet roll. I should worry less. I should worry more. Will anything ever make sense? We don't know how the consciousness trick is done yet. And to be honest, maybe we never will. But even then, even if we never do, the mystery is here and it's gorgeous and it's everywhere. As G.K. Chesterton put it, but now a great thing in the street seems any human nod. We're shift in strange democracy the million masks of God. It is not a pleasant condition to endure, living in an age when we know more about the heavens than we do the mechanisms of our own heads. Personally, some days I find it fucking horrifying. 
But things are changing. Inside the sciences today, it's finally becoming fashionable to study consciousness. The science of how we experience is just getting going now. Science is coming home from its mad flight in the stars, back down the telescope, to ask about the mind looking up the telescope. We're living at the birth of a theory of us, and I will bet you my cash on this. In the miraculous event we actually get through this teenage phase in our development, we might stand a chance of maturing into an adult species. We might live one day in a time of perfect explanations and finished science, when most things have been measured and explained, when the mechanisms of consciousness and experience are as well understood as the dynamics of flight are today. But I will also bet you, my cat, that there are eyes in that enlightened time, looking back longingly, wishing they could know what it was like for us today. To have lived in the great age of mysteries, to have looked around and seen question marks everywhere and found the courage in spite of the dreadful uncertainties, in spite of not knowing how our souls work, to still carry on and still be at least half decent. Back when humans were clueless about their own mental mechanisms. Back in the quiet ignorance of the 21st century, in the days of wild unknowing, when all you needed to do to remind yourself of how gorgeously weird the world is was to remember that for all we could explain sound, we had no idea how it became music in our minds. And to remember that for all we could explain light, we had no idea how it became color. When all that was required to remember just how close the unknown is to us was to look up to the horizon around evening and to know that for all the mysteries of the sky and beyond the sky, for all the mysteries of our sun and the dust she came from, on any given evening, below any given sunset, as the heavens look down on us, clearly the real mystery all along was looking back up at the heavens. Fucking out. That ending is too pretentious even for me. Uh, bogeys, willies, etc. Don't forget to brush your teeth. Being alive is weird. Until next time then.